Hi, it's Kim, and this is a big topic. This is transport across cell membranes. And we're going to be talking primarily about how materials move across the plasma membrane, which is the, the membrane that surrounds the cells of living organisms. So let's just quickly talk a little bit, just very generally about the plasma membrane. It is the boundary between the cell's internal and external environment. And it regulates the transport of everything in and out of the cell. And it receives stimuli from the outside of the cell and initiates responses to that stimuli. So that plasma membrane is incredibly important to understand. When you're looking at a basic cell structure, just quickly draw a basic cell for you. What we typically draw just as a line on the outside of the cell, this is what we're referring to. This is the plasma membrane. It's obviously a lot more complex than just that blue line around the outside of the cell. So what does it really look like? We've looked at this a little bit already because we have talked about phospholipids in some detail a couple of times now. We talked about them when we talked about properties of water and we talked about them when we talked about lipids. So here we are again. Here we are going to actually see those phospholipids in action regulating things moving in and out of the plasma membrane, in and out of the cell. So again, if we drew a typical cell, this is what we're blowing up. This membrane on the outside of the cell is what we're seeing here. And you can see, even though this is a very small image, these are all the phospholipids, okay? And you can see this membrane is mostly phospholipids. And remember that those phospholipids are unique in that they have a region that is polar and a region that is nonpolar. So remember those phospholipids have a head region, which is shown cartoon version there, and that head region is polar, meaning it can mix with water, it can interface with water, versus the tails, which are fatty acids, meaning that those tails are nonpolar. So nonpolar fatty acid tails. We're going to look at the structure of those molecules in more detail today, and we're going to look at those tails in particular, because if you recall, fatty acids can be saturated fatty acids or unsaturated fatty acids. And those tails can be saturated or unsaturated fatty acids. Remember the difference is in the shape of that molecule due to double bonds between carbons versus all single bonds between carbons. And we'll talk about that in more detail. But you see, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot more than just phospholipids when we look at this diagram of the plasma membrane. So let's talk about what some of those components of the plasma membrane are. I'll just make some room here. I'm going to list them. Obviously, the first thing we're going to list are phospholipids. So I'm going to say that one more time. So this is going to be components of the plasma membrane. And the first one, phospholipids. In fact, it's a phospholipid. Do you remember the term for? that double layer that they form. It's a phospholipid bilayer. So we have heads pointing outward and heads pointing inward and all the tails that are being repelled by the water inside the cell and outside the cell, all the tails are pointing inward. My apologies, as I get toward the edge of the slide, it always becomes darker. It looks sloppy, but there's really nothing I can do to avoid that since I don't have much space here. Second thing you notice are a bunch of proteins. Those proteins are incredibly important in regulating what moves in and out of the cell. So you, this is a protein, this is a protein. You can see this is what's called a channel protein. It provides a channel for materials to move in or out of the cell. 
You can see this other transmembrane protein here that's doing something for the cell. We'll be talking about those proteins today. Another thing you see are these cell surface markers called glycolipids and glycoproteins. We won't be talking about those much today. Really, actually, I'm just going to talk about them right now. Okay, let, let's look at these terms. So glyco, what other molecule have we looked at that sounds like glyco, starts with a glyco? Glycogen, and what category of macromolecule was glycogen? Is it a lipid? Is it a protein? Is it a nucleic acid? It's a carbohydrate. So the glyco part of both of these is carbohydrate. So glycoprotein is going to be carbohydrate plus a protein, carbohydrate plus a lipid for the glycolipids. So the glycoprotein, you see this protein, and then there's a chain of glucose attached to that. These cell surface markers have a variety of important functions in our cells or for our cells, but cell recognition is a huge important role of those cell surface markers. So cell surface markers help cells recognize each other as being self. So we know those are our cells versus something foreign. They help different cell types recognize each other and help cells recognize really a lot of things happening outside the cell. It's a big part of cell communication. So those are the cell surface markers. Then you also see something that is a lipid that we've talked about, and that is cholesterol. This little blue molecule right here is cholesterol. So I'm going to put that number four on our list of components of the plasma membrane. And we're going to talk today about the role of cholesterol in the plasma membrane. As you recall from the lipids lecture, cholesterol has a lot of roles in the body, one of which is a component of the plasma membrane. So let's look at those phospholipids again in more detail. If you'll recall from the fatty acid lecture during lipids, if the chain is straight, that is because there are all single bonds between the carbons and those carbons are completely saturated in hydrogen, holding as many hydrogens as they possibly can. So the straight tails that we see here, these are the saturated fatty acid tails. The one with the bend or the kink in the chain, that is due to at least one double bond between carbons, and in this case, it is one double bond between the carbons. And the molecule is going to bend on the other side of that double bonded carbon. So that one is not completely saturated in hydrogen due to that double bond. So this would be the unsaturated fatty acid. That is significant when we're talking about phospholipids, because if you line up a bunch of phospholipids together, if they all had saturated fatty acid tails, they would all be very linear, and there would be almost no gaps in that membrane, no space for materials to move across. Having a bend in some of those tails creates a space to allow materials to move across. So let's say now this one has one saturated and one unsaturated fatty acid. And so does this one. And then same over here, let's say that this one has, and I'm exaggerating this space here, but you start to get the point. Sorry, I made this one upside down. Come on, you can erase, oh boy doesn't want to erase, so I'm just going to have to draw over it. So straight, <laughs> sorry about that. I'll just draw as if he doesn't exist. Now this creates a space. 
So that unsaturated fatty acid tail, the more of those we have, the more materials can move across. And we say that that membrane is more permeable. So a term that's really frequently used with regard to the plasma membrane is that the plasma membrane is selectively permeable. So if it was impermeable, that would mean nothing could move across. If it's completely permeable, that means everything can just move across. It's selectively permeable. It's selecting what can move across. It's selecting for that a couple of ways. One, the proteins. The proteins are only going to allow certain molecules to move in and out. Number two, we have these nonpolar tails. That's going to regulate certain materials moving across. And then we have these gaps that can form based on the number of unsaturated fatty acids that exist on the phospholipids in that membrane. So if you have a lot of these, it's going to be very permeable. If you don't have very many at all, it will be slightly impermeable, except for the proteins. So the number of these, the number of the unsaturated fatty acid tails is going to determine, going to determine the permeability of the membrane. Okay, high number of unsaturated fatty acid tails means high permeability. In other words, that bend is going to make a lot of gaps in the membrane for things to move across. More saturated fatty acid tails, more linear ones, that's going to decrease permeability of that membrane. Again, we have proteins embedded in that phospholipid bilayer, and that is very, very important to understand. And we won't talk about all the different types, but just realize they're not all channels. So this is a channel that when this channel is open, materials can just move in and out through that protein channel. But each molecule is going to have a specific channel. So there aren't general channels that allow all molecules to move through. It's going to be, again, selectively permeable. And those proteins select what can move in and out. It will recognize a molecule, and it, that molecule can fit through based on shape. We have receptor proteins where a specific molecule needs to bind to that receptor. And if it fits, it's allowed entry into the cell. So a lot of different categories of proteins we're not going to touch on all of them. Those would really be the main two that I would want you to know, receptors and then these channel proteins. So receptor proteins and channel proteins. When we talked about the different categories of proteins in the protein lecture, we mentioned both of those. This is an enzyme that's embedded in that membrane. So there are enzymes embedded in the phospholipid bilayer. Remember, enzymes are proteins. They reduce the amount of energy required to start a chemical reaction. Very, very important. We're now going to start talking about the different types of transport across the plasma membrane, how molecules move in and out of the cell. And those are really divided into two major categories of transport. We have what's called passive transport, and we have what's called active transport. Okay, one of these two categories of transport requires energy, and the other does not require energy. It happens just based on concentration gradients and does not require energy. Based on those names, passive, and active, which one do you think requires energy? That's right, it's the active transport. So looking at just the most basic difference between these two categories of transport, active transport, energy required. And the form of that energy, of course, you can see in the picture, ATP, 
So ATP is the form of energy that is required to carry out active transport. And during this lecture, you will find out why that type of transport requires energy. Passive transport, on the other hand, no energy required. It's just going to happen based on concentration gradients, and you'll see how that happens. Two major categories of passive transport, diffusion and facilitated diffusion. We're going to call this one simple diffusion to really differentiate it from facilitated diffusion. The big difference is that facilitated diffusion is going to require proteins to be involved. So when molecules are moving from area of high concentration to area of lower concentration, and there's a protein involved, that's going to be facilitated diffusion. Simple diffusion is just simply across the phospholipid bilayer. Whereas facilitated diffusion is going to be requiring some proteins. So let's start looking at simple diffusion. Let's say I stood in the corner of the room and I blew out a big plume of cigarette smoke. Over time, that cigarette smoke is going to move throughout the room and it's going to fill the entire room until those molecules reach what's called equilibrium. Equilibrium is a very important term when we're talking about diffusion. And really this part of the term really tells you what it means, equal. It's an equal state. When we're talking about a membrane, what we mean is equal concentration on both sides of the membrane. So if we had a cell, we obviously have the inside of the cell and we have the outside of the cell. We refer to those two areas based on a term that involves the fluid or the, the liquid portion. So we call this the ECF outside the cell and the area inside the cell we call the ICF. Extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid. So ECF is extracellular fluid and you can see that here in the diagram. Extracellular fluid. Okay, if this was inside the cell, they're calling it the cytoplasm, but it's also the intracellular fluid. Sorry, I have to take a sip of water really fast. So ECF, and ICF. If something is an equal concentration on both sides of the membrane, it means there are the same number of molecules on the outside of the cell as there are on the inside of the cell. And molecules will tend to reach equilibrium across that plasma membrane with no energy required if they can cross. So if they're a molecule that can just passively cross without any energy required, they are going to move from area of high concentration to area of low concentration with no energy required. So simple diffusion is movement of molecules from area 
of higher concentration to area of lower concentration no energy required. It just happens based on the concentration gradient. So you can see in this progression of time, we start out with all of these molecules in the ECF. So they're high outside and low inside. In fact, there are none inside. And now they start moving across. They're going to be moving from high to low. So from the ECF to the ICF, no energy required. And finally, at the end, they reach equilibrium. This would be equilibrium where they're equal on both sides of the membrane. Okay, so the question is, what molecules can do that? So in a human cell, what molecules can just move based on simple diffusion? Well, it has to be molecules that can move across those nonpolar tails of the phospholipids. And this is a list of what can do that. Okay, oxygen and carbon dioxide. The way we exchange O2 and CO2 between our lungs and our tissue is through simple diffusion. And I'm going to show you that as an example of simple diffusion. It's really the classic example of simple diffusion in our body. No energy required to do gas exchange at the cellular level. Um, some water cross, but it really takes a long time. We really requ we require these special proteins called aquaporins. You can see that term here. Aquaporins, I'm going to show you a picture of those in a couple of minutes, but these are actually proteins that allow water to cross the membrane. Okay, if it's a protein involved, then that is facilitated diffusion, not simple diffusion, but a little bit of water can leak across. It's just really a slow process. Why? Because those nonpolar tails don't want that water moving across. If you have a lot of bends in the tails, in other words, a lot of unsaturated fatty acids in the membrane, then a little bit of water can leak across. Really small uncharged molecules can move across. And this is the key, uncharged, okay? That means no ions can just move across through those phospholipid bilayers. Those tails will keep those uncharged ions, I mean, I'm sorry, will keep those charged ions from moving across. Remember, ions have a charge. Okay, so ions cannot move across. It has to be uncharged, really small things. So for example, if we were in person, right now for a lab, we would be doing an experiment where you determine whether or not iodine can move in and out of the cell. And that iodine can, it's a very small uncharged molecule. And so it's able to just cross that semi-permeable, selectively permeable membrane. Okay, steroids and fatty acids can move across. Why? Because they are nonpolar, just like the phospholipid tails. So nonpolar molecules are allowed to cross because those phospholipid tails don't repel them. Anything polar could not move across those tails, including water. The only way water can is it can sometimes, pretty small, can leak across, but just a tiny bit. So those are the molecules that can just move across by simple diffusion. What molecules can't just simply move across? Anything with a charge. Okay, so that includes ions, they're charged. 
really large molecules are anything that's polar, can't move across. So that's the list of what cannot just move across the membrane. Here's another picture showing equilibrium. The top picture shows if it's just one solute and the bottom picture shows if it's two different solutes. That term solute, remember that a solution Try this again. Solution is a solute plus a solvent. And in this case, the solvent is water and the solute is what's dissolved in the water. And in this case, it's these molecules. Okay, so the top one is the orange molecules, the bottom one is the orange and the purple. And you can see that on the bottom example, we start off with mostly orange on one side, well, really all orange on one side and all purple on the other side, but they eventually we reach equilibrium, equal amounts on both sides of the membrane. So equilibrium is the goal and the result a simple diffusion. Let's look at oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange as a really good example of simple diffusion in our bodies. So this is a very basic schematic of what happens. You breathe in O2 and you breathe out CO2. Why? Why are we breathing in O2 and breathing out CO2? Because of cellular respiration. Remember that the general formula for cellular respiration, we use glucose in our general equation, even though it's obviously not the only thing that we can use to carry out cellular respiration. And we need oxygen to combust that glucose. Products, carbon dioxide and water. And of course, on average 36 to 38 ATP for every glucose. But carbon dioxide is a product of cellular respiration. So at any given time, your cells are carrying out cellular respiration. They are using oxygen and producing carbon dioxide. So you need a constant supply of oxygen coming into your cells and you need that carbon dioxide to leave your cells because it's a product and it is acidic. That's the job of your circulatory system and your respiratory system that work together. So you inhale, you bring in O2, and you exhale CO2. That CO2 came from your cells. The O2 needs to get to your cells. Okay, so blue is usually representing low oxygen blood and red is usually representing high oxygen blood. It doesn't mean unoxygenated and oxygenated because even on the blue side, there's still some oxygen in that blood. Okay, your blood is, is not completely unoxygenated when it's returning to the heart to get pumped back to the lungs. So this is from the body. In other words, it's from the body cells. And because it came from the body cells, it dropped off oxygen and it picked up carbon dioxide. So this blood that's coming back is high in CO2 and low in O2. It picked up carbon dioxide that was being made during cell respiration and it dropped off oxygen to fuel more cell respiration. It comes into the heart and it gets pumped to the lungs. Okay, in the lungs, you just inhaled oxygen and you exhaled CO2. Okay, so in the lungs, you have these air sacs. So let's, you've got your trachea and going to branch into each lung and get smaller and smaller in your lungs. And then eventually it's going to end in these little air sacs. 
called alveoli. Singular is alveolus. And covering that air sac is a network of capillaries, these really small blood vessels. And that's where the O2 and CO2 is, exchange is going to happen. So you just inhaled oxygen. So that air sac is high in O2 and low in CO2. So when these red blood cells circulate, they're pumped to the lungs, that low oxygen blood is going to pick up oxygen from the lungs just based on concentration gradient. It's also going to drop off carbon dioxide based on concentration gradient. And I'm going to show you a more detailed picture of that in a minute. The high oxygen blood now comes back to the heart and it gets pumped out to the body. So this, this blood leaving the heart from the lungs is now high in O2 and low in CO2 because those red blood cells dropped off CO2 and picked up O2. Now they're going back to the body. So let's look at that at the air sac. So at the air sac, we have this low O2 blood. It's from the body, from the body cells. And as it comes in, just based on concentration gradient, it's going to drop off CO2. So CO2 is getting dropped off and it's going to pick up O2. So you can see O2 moving in. So it's turning from blue, which is low oxygen to red. Okay, let me erase this. I know the writing on here is really small, but you can see oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. These three on the red side are oxygens. And that's going into the blood. Because this is low oxygen blood, it's going to move from high to low. Same here, it's high CO2 in the blood. And so CO2 is gonna move out into the air sac. Sorry, I've already been talking a lot today, so I have to keep drinking water. Okay, now that blood goes from the lungs to the body cells, <clears throat> and this, this red blood cell just came from the lungs. So this red blood cell, when it gets here, it's high in O2 and low in CO2. These body cells have been carrying out cell respiration. Okay, so they're low in O2 and high in CO2 because they used oxygen and they produce carbon dioxide through cell respiration. Now, just based on concentration gradient, high to low, high CO2 is gonna go to low CO2. High oxygen is gonna go to low oxygen. So CO2 is going into the red blood cell and oxygen is going into the body cell. Okay, that, that red blood cell, he just keeps circulating all day long doing his job, okay? He's not gonna go back to the lungs because now that he, he has picked up CO2 and dropped off oxygen, he has now changed his state to the opposite and he needs to go back and drop off CO2 and pick up O2 again. He's just a little shuttle all day. Dropping off, picking up, dropping off, picking up. No energy required. So O2, CO2 exchange equals simple diffusion. No energy required. Okay. Facilitated diffusion. Sorry, these are somehow out of order all of a sudden. Facilitated diffusion is passive transport also. Okay, so passive transport, that means no energy required. The reason there's no energy required is because molecules will continue to move 
from high concentration to low concentration. And I'm just abbreviating concentration here. The difference is it's being facilitated by proteins. So proteins are required. Let's look at these ion channels. Remember ions have a charge. Because they're charged, they can't cross the phospholipid bilayer. The only way they can move in and out of the cell is with these proteins facilitating that. So you can see we have sodium channels, calcium channels, potassium channels, chlorine channels, all very specific to those ions. Ion channels are incredibly important in your cells. And if you go on to take physiology, you're going to learn how those ion channels play a role in your nerves transmitting electricity, so nerve impulses, and also in muscle contraction. So really, really important to understand this is transport of ions along a concentration gradient, so from high to low, and it's through these specific protein channels that will only allow that one ion to cross. Here's another picture of those ion channels. And there are a lot of different categories. You don't need to know any of those terms right now. So don't pay any attention to these terms like ligand gated, mechanically gated, et cetera. Just know there are a bunch of different kinds of ion channels, but really what they all share in common is they are all proteins that allow one specific type of ion to cross. So that would be an example of facilitated diffusion. Again, passive transport, no energy required. Another category of passive transport is water movement. And technically, that would be considered facilitated diffusion. It's called osmosis. And I have, I have this blank so that I can write on it for you. So osmosis is water movement. And water movement is in its own category because it's it's a little bit unique and there are some additional terms associated with water movement. So let's talk about that for a moment. So water, just like solutes, can move from area of high concentration to low concentration. And when it comes to water, what do we mean by that? So let's imagine that we have a cell Okay, remember ICF, intracellular fluid, ECF, extracellular fluid. And let's say that we're talking about, I'm just going to have it be um, a big molecule such as sodium chloride. And inside the cell, we have a lot of it. And outside, we just have a little bit. What does that have to do with water? Well, sometimes the solute is too big to move across the phospholipid bilayer, and it doesn't have a protein to allow it to move. And the cell still is trying to achieve equilibrium. It needs that salt concentration to be equal inside the cell and outside the cell. If you can't move the salt, what you can move is the water. Because if we send a lot of water into that cell, we can dilute that higher salt concentration. And that's exactly what will happen. The salts are going to stay concentrated in that cell until we send in water. So solute concentration, Remember the solute is what's dissolved in the water. In this scenario, that solute concentration is significantly higher inside the cell relative to outside the cell. Gosh, this just gets crazy on the edges, doesn't it? So that word is relative. 
So when you compare the two, the solute concentration is a lot higher inside the cell. Okay, the salt cannot move. It can't leave the cell. So instead, what we can move is water. Another way to think of it is, is if I make water, the blue dots, if these are water molecules, we have a lot outside the cell than inside the cell because it's saltier inside the cell. So this is water. So we can either think of it one of two ways. We can think of it as water is going to move from high concentration outside the cell to low concentration inside the cell. In other words, water is going to move into the cell. So water moves from area of high water concentration, again, I'm abbreviating concentration, to low water concentration. But the way we normally think of that is really not based on water concentration. We think of it based on solute concentration. So water is going to move toward the higher solute concentration to dilute it until equilibrium is reached. Because if we send enough water into that cell, we can dilute that salt concentration to be the same as it is outside the cell. So water moves toward the higher solute concentration, whether that's inside the cell or outside the cell. That's the direction that's wa the water is going to move. There are some important terms associated with this because obviously it could be the opposite. It could be that it was saltier outside the cell than inside. It could be that they were equal. How does water move in those three different scenarios? Equal, higher outside, higher inside. When we're talking about solute concentration. There are some important terms associated with that that we're going to get to in a minute. But first, I want to remind you of this term we saw a few minutes ago, aquaporins. Okay, these are protein channels that allow water to pass across those hydrophobic tails of the phospholipid bilayer. So these are channel proteins that allow water movement. Some cells really are more involved in water regulation than others. In fact, water balance in a living organism is an incredibly important topic in biology. Every organism needs a constant supply of water and how we control that is really important. It's called osmoregulation. And on the most basic level, cells can become more or less permeable to water in a couple of ways. And one of the ways that they can do that is by either having more aquaporins to allow more water to move in and out of the cell or to regulate the amount of cholesterol. Now that's a different topic altogether. So we're just gonna put this on the back burner for now, more cholesterol. I will come back to this slide because coming up later, there is a slide that shows you cholesterol and how it stabilizes the plasma membrane to make it less permeable. Okay, so more cholesterol equals less permeable. Fewer aquaporins, less permeable. And again, we're talking about water. Really more cholesterol is going to make it less permeable to all molecules that can cross the membrane. Primarily, we're talking about molecules that can just cross the phospholipid bilayer. So we're going to come back to, to cholesterol.
these are the three possible scenarios for a cell. Okay, it's either higher solute concentration outside, higher solute concentration inside, or they're the same. So three important terms here, and I'm going to give them to you in order of how they appear on these pictures. ISO, hypo, and hyper. So ISO, hypo, and hyper. I don't know if you've ever heard the term isometric exercises. So if I had some dumbbells in my room right now, I could pick up the two dumbbells. And if I was doing isometric exercises, I would want to do the same weight and the same movement and the same number of reps on both sides of my body. So both arms, okay? Iso means same. Hypo, if you have hypothermia, it means your body temperature is below normal. Hypo means below. If you're hyperactive, it means your activity level is above normal. So hyper means above. So this would be lower and this would be higher. This whole topic of solute concentration inside and outside the cell is called tonicity. And you actually have tonicity sensors in your body that regulate water balance based on is your ECF solute concentration too high or too low? And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So the word tonic goes with all of these terms also. So we have isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. And in this situation, it's referring to the environment of the cell. Okay, so let's call this an isotonic ECF, a hypotonic ECF, and a hypertonic ECF. That's the environment of the cell. That's the fluid outside the cell. Iso means the same. So in the case of an isotonic ECF, it means equal solute concentration. And I'm going to continue just to abbreviate that for now. So equal solute concentration inside the cell, and outside the cell. Okay, in other words, ICF equals ECF, solute concentration. And in that scenario, water is going to move into the cell and out of the cell at an equal rate because the solute concentration is equal. And you can see that in the first picture here, you can see those two arrows moving out of the cell and into the cell because water is moving at an equal rate both into the cell and out of the cell. That second picture shows you hypotonic. In a hypotonic environment, the solute concentration outside the cell is actually pretty low. What they're not showing you in this picture is if this is a living cell, it has a solute concentration. Okay, if, it's, if a cell had a zero solute concentration, that would not be a living cell. So what they're not showing you is that there's a lot of solute inside the cell relative to outside the cell. Water is going to move toward the higher solute concentration. So that means into the cell. So hypotonic ECF means lower solute concentration outside the cell. In other words, in the ECF, the solute concentration is lower. Hypertonic, you can see here, a lot of solutes outside the cell. 
Water is going to tend to move toward the higher solute concentration. So water is going to move out of the cell. So hypertonic means higher solute concentration outside the cell. Gosh, that's really messy. Concentration. <laughs> So higher solute concentration outside the cell. What this means for the cell really is over time, and I thought I had a picture of this right now, but I don't. But over time, if this is an animal cell and water is moving out of the cell because it's too concentrated outside the cell, that cell is going to dehydrate. So let's think about this for a minute. Let's say you drink a bunch of water and you don't allow your kidneys to do their job. In other words, getting rid of excess water. So you have all of this water, your bladder is full, your kidneys can't pump any more water into your bladder. So now all of this water just has to hang out in your blood. And what that does is it really dilutes the concentration of solutes outside the cell. So I'm going to do an even more exaggerated picture of this. So I'm going to draw a cell in a hypotonic environment. Okay, so here's our cell. And there are a lot of solutes in the cell. It's a living cell, it's doing its job. There are a lot of different solutes in here. And I just drank a bunch of water, a lot of water. And I haven't eliminated that water. So we have a really low concentration outside the cell. So high, low in terms of solute concentration. This would be a hypotonic ECF. And in this case, water is going to move toward the higher solute concentration. So water is going to start moving into the cell. And over time, if there's a big enough difference in solute concentration inside the cell or outside the cell, and that cell just keeps filling with water, if this is an animal cell, that animal cell will lice or burst. And this can happen. This has happened. If you don't allow your kidneys to do their job in eliminating water, you're causing a very hypotonic ECF and water is just going to start moving into your cells and over time those cells will burst. Okay, that's only an animal cell. We're gonna talk about plant cells in a minute. That animal cell will burst if it's too big of a concentration difference. Again, water moves toward the higher sol solute concentration, so into the cell. Okay, let's look at the opposite. Let's look at a hypertonic environment. Sorry, I just have to erase here. It's going slower than I hoped. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to talk about an animal cell again. So let's say you don't drink water for a long time. It's a hot day, you've worked out, you come back in, you're doing some work around the house, you're thirsty, but you're not really paying attention to that. Cause you're like, I am too busy to drink water right now. What's going to happen over time is as the water in your blood gets lower and lower because you haven't consumed any water, your ECF is going to become very concentrated with solutes. So not drinking enough water is going to create a hypertonic environment for this cell. So the ECF becomes hypertonic 
the solute concentration is higher than what is inside the cell. Water moves toward the higher solute concentration. So water is going to start leaving this cell. Water is leaving the cell. And over time, an animal cell will start to really shrink or shrivel. And eventually, it will die. We create this when we don't drink enough water. Okay, so part of the water balance is you can't have too much. If you have too much water out here, you really dilute this solute concentration to the point where water starts moving into your cells and your cells could burst. If you don't drink enough water, or let's say you drink salt water, okay, if you, if you were in the ocean and you accidentally drank some salt water, the reason we can't drink salt water is we create this hypertonic situation where our cells dehydrate, the water starts leaving. So both of these scenarios have repercussions for animal cells. Let's quickly talk about what a plant does. It's important to understand the difference. Remember what plant cells have that animal cells don't have. If you think about the cell lecture and you also think about the carbohydrate lecture, remember that plant cells have a cell wall outside the cell. And this is actually a strategy that plants use to be able to bring water into their tissues when they are low on water. Plants need a constant supply of water for a lot of reasons, as all living organisms do, but they also need water to carry out photosynthesis. Water is the first reactant that actually goes into photosynthesis. So plant cells, make them green. So here's a plant cell and let's see, plasma membrane, nuclear envelope, and then outside that plasma membrane, this cellulose layer, all the way around, that is the cell wall. Remember, it's made of cellulose, a structural polysaccharide, it's a chain of glucose. That cell wall is very rigid and it will not burst. So what this cell can do is when water is scarce or just really in general, it needs to keep drawing water into its cells. So it will tend to concentrate solutes in the plant cells. So now when even the slightest bit of water becomes available, water is going to move in to the cell toward the high solute concentration. So think about it, it, it rains for the first time in months. And what that plant has done is in its root cells, it is concentrated solutes. So as soon as that water becomes available in the soil, it will be pulled into those plant cells because of this higher solute concentration. Lower solute concentration outside the cell than inside the cell. So the plant cell has set up this hypotonic environment for this cell. That hypotonic environment now is going to allow the water to move into the cells when it's available. And guess what, because of that cell wall, these plant cells don't burst. In fact, this is a happy plant cell. It's called turgid. Filled with water. And again, a plant cell in a hypotonic environment will not burst because of that plant cell wall. It becomes turgid. A plant cell wall in a hypertonic environment where it is saltier outside, it will still lose water just like an animal cell will. So a plant cell will also shrink or shrivel. So if you put salt water on your plants, they will die. 
the water will leave the cells and they will die. In the winter time, when they put salt on the roads to control ice, that salt kills all of the plants along the road. If we had an event with a hurricane that brought a storm surge and that salt water suddenly came onto all of the plants, all of those plants would die. And this is why that becomes a hypertonic environment and all the water leaves the plant cells and they shrink or shrivel just as an animal cell would. But believe it or not, a plant cell is actually unhappy in an isotonic environment. Plants are happiest in hypotonic environment because that means they can bring that water into their cells. Okay, one more example of this, with these two fish. Saltwater fish and freshwater fish. Both of these fish have solutes in their cells. Because they are living organisms, they have solutes. So this guy has solutes in his cells, and this one has solutes in his cells. The difference is in the water, in their environment. And they are both specialized to their environment. So saltwater fish, obviously, a lot of solute outside the fish. Whereas this freshwater fish is going to have very low solutes outside. But you know, he's a living fish, so he has some solute inside, just as this guy has some solute inside. It's going to make those a little bit bigger. So we'll start with the saltwater fish. Is this saltwater fish in a hypertonic environment or a hypotonic environment? So hyper means higher, hypo means lower, and we're referring to the environment of this fish, so outside the fish. Outside the fish is saltier. So this would be a hypertonic environment. So over time, is this fish going to gain water from his environment or is he going to lose water to the environment? Remember, water moves toward the, the higher solute concentration. So water is going to move out of this fish. And over time, this guy would dehydrate if he didn't have a strategy for dealing with this. Okay, so do you think that this fish, based on the fact that he's just, he's always losing water to his environment, should his kidneys be designed to eliminate as much water as possible or conserve as much water as possible? His kidneys should conserve water. In fact, they don't have the ability to get rid of a bunch of water. He's specialized to this environment. So kidneys conserve water. He's not, an, he's not an advanced animal in terms of this. He, he only has one strategy, conserve water. And once again, I have to rewrite because that was too sloppy. So kidneys conserve water. Now let's look at the freshwater fish. The freshwater fish, more solutes inside than outside. So is his environment hypotonic or hypertonic? Hypotonic. Is he going to tend to take on water or lose water? Well, if water is moving toward the higher solute concentration, water is moving into this fish. So he's constantly taking on water from his environment. So should his kidneys be designed to conserve water or get rid of as much water as possible? He has kidneys that eliminate a lot of water, as much water as possible. If these two traded environments that they aren't specialized for, they will die very quickly, okay? Let's say we put the, the freshwater fish in the salt water. He doesn't have the ability to conserve water. He's going to start suddenly losing water to his environment. At the same time as his kidneys are continuing to eliminate water, he's going to dehydrate very quickly. And conversely, if we put this guy 
in a freshwater environment, his kidneys are designed to conserve water and he's taking on all this water from the environment. He's, his cells are going to start exploding very quickly and he will die also. He would have to rescue both of those fish very quickly if they were put into the wrong fish tank. Okay, so again, strategy to deal with their environment, they're adapted or specialized to their environment. Now, some fish can do both. So salmon are born in fresh water and they're born with a freshwater kidney. And as they're maturing and they're migrating to the ocean, their kidney matures into a saltwater kidney. When they come back to reproduce, they die because they're back in the freshwater and the kidney can't deal with that. Okay, water balance in humans. It's important to understand where we have fluid. Primarily, we have fluid inside of our cells, outside of our cells, and in the plasma. So the ECF, the extracellular fluid, includes the plasma of your blood. So inside your cell, that's the ICF, and you can see that in the picture. The ECF includes all of that fluid outside the cells, which is called your interstitial fluid. You don't need to know that term, I'm just showing it to you. <clears throat> and then we also have fluid in our blood plasma. And you can see that here. So we have the extracellular fluid, which is also called the interstitial fluid. It means it's really the fluid in between the cells. It's outside the cells, but it's not in your blood vessels. That plasma is intravascular, meaning it's inside your blood vessels. Water balance in humans is a lot more complex than it is in a lot of um, animals. And we actually have a hormone that helps us do that. The water content of your blood is something that must ma be maintained for a lot of reasons. So this would be another example of homeostasis in the body. And you can see that the amount of urine you produce is going to change based on if your water content is too low or your water content's too high. <clears throat> Obviously, if the water content's too high, we wanna get rid of that fluid. And if it's too low, we wanna conserve fluid. So we have methods for, methods for doing this and it primarily involves this hormone called ADH. Anti-diuretic hormone. Okay, if you've ever taken a diuretic or you know a person who's taken a diuretic, diuretic pills are called water pills. They make you get rid of extra water. So antidiuretic is going to do the opposite. ADH is going to cause you to conserve water. And it also makes you feel thirsty. So you'll drink water. So you feel thirst to stimulate you to drink more water. So that ADH, because it does those two, it gets released when your interstitial fluid and your blood plasma has too high of a concentration of solutes. So in response to high solute concentration, outside of your cells. So in the plasma, and in the ECF. So high sol solute concentration outside your cells, it's not going to let me write that there. <laughs> you're going to make ADH when you're dehydrated, in other words. So when, that when you're dehydrated, the solute concentration outside your cells is higher. In other words, the solutes are still there. What, what's missing is water. It's kind of like if you put a, you know, if you had a little bit of salt in a beaker of water and you put it outside in the sun and the water starts evaporating, it's suddenly going to be a lot saltier in there because the salt doesn't leave, just the water does. Okay, so you can see in this picture that you're going to have low urine output and you're going to produce ADH to cause you to conserve water and to drink more water. Opposite is true. If you drink a lot of water, you're going to produce less ADH and you're going to have high urine output. So we can change the amount of urine that we produce because we are higher mammals. 
we have hormones to help us regulate our water. So osmoregulation, again, this means water balance. And this is incredibly important in all living organisms. You don't need to reproduce this picture in any way, shape, or form. I just wanted to show you that we have these feedback loops that cause us to regulate how much urine we produce based on solute concentration outside of our cells. Okay, so we've talked about passive transport and now we're going to talk about active transport. So just a reminder that passive transport This is molecules moving along a concentration gradient. This is molecules moving from high concentration, which I'm going to abbreviate again, to low concentration. No energy required. Sometimes though, we need to move molecules from low to high, and that is going to require energy. So in this picture, you see these little molecules that have eyeballs. They are lower on this side and higher on this side. If we want to get all of these to this side of the membrane, we're going to have to pump those molecules or use some sort of conformational change in a protein that allows us to move those against a concentration gradient. And causing that conformational change in the protein, meaning changing the shape of the protein, is going to require energy in the form of ATP. Okay, same here, you see just a few on this side. So we're going from low on this side to high on this side, and that requires ATP. So active transport, low concentration to high concentration, energy required in the form of ATP. And we can say that we're going against a concentration gradient. It's like trying to swim upstream, it requires energy. This is not going to happen automatically. It's going to require either pumping or it's going to require a conformational change in a protein that requires ATP. Classic example of this is the sodium potassium pump. You don't need to understand the details of exactly how the sodium potassium pump works, but this is a very important pump involved in setting up membrane potential to allow a cell to change the number of negative and positive ions across the membrane to allow electricity to be conducted. So this is the way your nervous system works. And when you take physiology, you'll learn about the sodium potassium pump. But basically it's pumping sodium and potassium from area of low concentration to area of high concentration. You don't need to know the details of how that happens. You can see that what's going to happen eventually is it's going to move sodium out of the cell and potassium into the cell. And all I want you to see in this picture, again, I don't want you to know the details of how the sodium potassium pump works, but I want you to see the sodium are the yellow dots and the potassium are these orange diamonds. So this is potassium ions and these are sodium ions. So sodium ions are high on this side and potassium ions are high on this side. So they're wanting to go from high to low through those ion channels, but there are times when we wanna close those channels or we just want to make the opposite happen. So if we wanna go from low to high, in other words, we want all of the sodium out. So you can see there's still some sodiums in here. So again, sodiums are the little yellow circles. If we want all of these to leave, if we want to get all of those across, 
that's going to require some pumping and that's going to require ATP. Okay, that's not going to just happen on its own because what, what's going to happen on its own is sodium is going to come in and potassium is going to leave. But if we want the opposite, if we want to go from low to high concentration, energy is going to be required. And that is active transport. And the energy required is ATP. That's all you need to know about that. Okay, also in the category of active transport is moving big materials wrapped in membrane. And we have two ways of doing that. We can bring stuff into the cell wrapped in membrane or we can make stuff leave the cell. Products of the cell are gonna leave wrapped in membrane. Remember that a membranous sac in the cell, a, a, like a sac made of phospholipids is called a vesicle. And in this case, you can see cellular eating and cellular drinking is kind of what these are, are called. So bringing materials into the cell by wrapping them in membrane. In this first example, that's called phagocytosis. I'm going to write it bigger because this is such an important term. Phago, pH is, sounds like F, phagocytosis, cellular eating. Um, protists, <laughs> my brain went blank there for a second. Protists eat this way. So single celled organisms eat by wrapping their food in membrane and bringing it in and then using lysosomes to digest that food. This is also how our white blood cells work. So we have phagocytic white blood cells that ingest pathogens and, and break them down for us in our immune system. Penocytosis is the second one over, and this is cellular drinking. This is bringing in small droplets of liquid, again, wrapping it in a membrane and bringing it in. Okay, then we have what's called receptor-mediated endocytosis. This is actually how we process cholesterol in our bodies. If we eat bad cholesterol, our cells have the ability to bring that in and break it down. But in order for that to happen, a molecule has to bind to a specific receptor on the cell surface. The cell has to recognize that molecule and then it wraps membrane around and brings it in. So receptor mediated endocytosis just means that that, that molecule has to bind to a specific receptor to be brought into the cell. And again, this is how we deal with cholesterol. I wanted to show you um, this picture. <laughs> this amoeba has actually just ingested these two paramecia. So here's one. And here's one. And it did that by phagocytosis. It just wrapped membrane around and brought those entire cells in to eat them. And then this is um, one of our white blood cells that has ingested those bacteria by endocytosis, specifically phagocytosis. And so this would be a phagocytic white blood cell. And you can see it's about to devour two more. Exocytosis is materials leaving the cell that were wrapped in membrane. So remember in the cell lecture, we talked about materials being produced in the rough ER. Okay, so this would be a protein product, or we have several products of the smooth ER, such as lipid-based hormones. And the way those are going to leave the cell is they're carried in a vesicle. So remember, this is called a transport vesicle. And those materials are going to eventually go up and membrane fuses with membrane. So the two membranes fuse and eventually those materials leave the cell and that's called exocytosis. Okay. 
Think of exo as meaning exit, exiting the cell. Okay, just a quick review of how molecules get across the plasma membrane. Okay, so there can be gaps in the phospholipid bilayer that are produced by primarily those unsaturated fatty acids in the tail region of the phospholipids. So unsaturated fatty acid tails on the phospholipids are going to create gaps. And when materials just move straight across the phospholipid bilayer, that is called simple diffusion. And remember, no energy required, moving from high concentration to low concentration. Facilitated diffusion <clears throat> and active transport are both going to require proteins. The difference is facilitated diffusion is passive, and this is obviously active, meaning no energy required for passive versus energy required. And then finally, using vesicles to move materials into the cell through endocytosis or out of the cell through exocytosis. I just wanna show you again, the picture that shows saturated versus unsaturated phospholipids. So if they were all unsaturated, it would look like this. I mean, I'm sorry, all saturated. So this is all saturated fatty acids not very permeable. The bends, the bends are unsaturated and that creates gaps in the membrane. Okay, so it says right here, more unsaturated fatty acids result in increased distance between the lipids, making the layer more fluid. In other words, more permeable. So increase, in unsaturated fatty acids in the phospholipids equals increased permeability of the membrane. How can we decrease permeability? We can decrease permeability by having fewer unsaturated fatty acids or by increasing the, the amount of cholesterol because cholesterol, here we go, finally, <laughs> an hour later, we finally get to it. Here's cholesterol in the membrane. The role that cholesterol plays in the membrane is it stabilizes the phospholipids. It makes the membrane less permeable. So increase in cholesterol in the membrane equals decreased permeability. So two factors there that are related to permeability, the types of tails on the fatty, uh, I'm sorry, the type of fatty acid tails on the phospholipid and how much cholesterol you have in the membrane. There's a lot of cholesterol, that membrane's really stable and those, what happens is those phospholipids aren't moving around. They tend to move left to right. That creates gaps in the membrane too. And when it's stable, that's not happening and you're not going to get as many materials moving across. Also important to realize that there are different factors that affect diffusion rates, temperature, molecule size, and difference in concentration. So real quickly, temperature. As temperature increase, so if we have an increase in temperature, I'm just going to abbreviate it temp. That's going to increase kinetic energy of the molecules, which means increase in molecular movement. So in that case, do you think materials are going to diffuse more quickly or more slowly? If molecules are moving around faster, that's an increased diffusion rate. So that's why trash smells worse on a hot day. <laughs> okay, so if you've ever lived in a city where people put a lot of trash out on certain days of the week and you go for a run, it smells horrible on a hot day because the diffusion rate is increased. Cold, freezing cold day when it's snowing, you don't smell people's trash. 
because the diffusion rate has is, is gone down. So as temperature increases, diffusion rate increases. Molecular size is the opposite of that, believe it or not. As the size of a molecule increases, they slow down. So think of a really big animal versus a, 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 a smaller animal. Smaller animals move faster than big animals, okay? So for molecular size, it's the, the opposite. So as molecular size or weight increases, diffusion rate actually decreases. So this is an inverse relationship. So big molecules move slower. If we were doing a DNA lab this semester, you would see that DNA diffuses through a gel based in its sorts by molecular size. So the bigger pieces of DNA, the heavier bases hang back while the smaller ones diffuse to the end faster. Difference in concentration. This is significant too. So let's look at this. Two different scenarios real quickly. Here's scenario A and scenario B. Here's our membrane, membrane. Just going to quickly draw two different scenarios. Okay, in scenario A, we have a lot of molecules on one side and not many on the other. And in scenario B, These are a lot closer in concentration in B. This is going to be slower diffusion because there's less of a difference in concentration across that membrane. This is going to be faster diffusion. There's a bigger concentration gradient difference. So difference in concentration on one side of the membrane versus the other is going to determine the rate at which molecules move to. In other words, if I stood in the corner and I blew out a tiny bit of cigarette smoke, it's going to diffuse through the room more slowly. If you're on the opposite side of the room, you're gonna smell it later <laughs> than if I blew out a huge plume of cigarette smoke, huge concentration difference, and it's going to move through the room more quickly. Okay, that was a lot, but that is it for transport across cell membranes.